Mertében dolgozott. Jó, azért nem hallgat, jó, hát ez a
um, the millet. Uh, Amy, can you hear us? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, Amy Parker, can you hear us? Courtney, can you hear us? I can. Okay. But. Uh, this is Courtney, yes, I can. Yes, I can hear you, but my. Um, I need to to somebody there in person. Yes. I can hear, but I honestly cannot understand a word they're saying because I think they have messed up. Amy, we can hear you. Well, I can't hear you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yes, I've got you. Okay. Could you run us through once again what the rules are for uh, approving a finding of fact? Uh, if some of our members are still attending virtually. Sure. Um, on the findings of fact, you have uh, by our, our ordinance, you have different findings you have to make for variances, conditional uses. Um, uh, appeals, things of that nature. And uh, a majority of the board must make written findings on each of those elements that are found in the ordinance. And I noticed in today's packet on a, uh, on a conditional use uh, that Kayla has the form and she has the, uh, the ordinances uh, written down for you that we have to make findings. And what you're not allowed to do according to the law is make uh, almost a cursory type of responses to the um, to the uh, to each element, you can't say, "Well, this is a uh, this property has a, is unique and and is uh, um, therefore there should be a, a variance because well the property is unique." You can't you can't just uh, mirror back to the, the question. You must make substantial uh, findings that appear in the record. And the record can be a, a lot of different ways. The record could be made from testimony that you hear during one of your hearings. It could be in a material that's presented to you by a petitioner. It could be material presented to you by a remonstrator, someone that's against the project, and you find that uh, the petition should not be granted. You could use that evidence for, uh, that's presented by the remonstrator. It could be a staff report, uh, the evidence that could be that would be given to us by Kayla and her team. That could be used as evidence. And the, there, there are, it's, speaking of evidence, it's not like a court. There's not rules of evidence. Hearsay is okay things of that nature. It just must be substantial and something that you hear. Courts, when they review our decisions, they look at you as the experts and they look for anything at all in the record that would, that would back up your decision. So really, um, you don't need to go crazy in terms of trying to find something and writing paragraph after paragraph, just latch onto something that's in your record to make your findings. Okay, and then if it's approved tonight, uh, Jenny and Kirby, they could approve, they could sign it here physically, um, but who, how would we get the other members' signatures? D due to the, it, it, we still are under the emergency uh, that the governor has issued. It's my position that if a, that a positive vote and an authorization via email uh, that uh, you or the clerk treasurer or any uh, town official can sign on their behalf similar to a power of attorney. We've done that. And so I, I, I believe that would be a, 
during these emergency times, which hopefully are nearing an end, um, those could be signed. And I, I can help you with the wording on that, but I think you could sign for them, Kayla. Okay. That's all right with you guys tonight if you choose to pass the signing of that. Permission to do that. Can everyone see that finding of that? the old lumberyard site and it's actually uh, we've kind of got a backlog of finding a fact from uh, during COVID this last spring uh, this was actually not approved until March of last year and uh, kind of it's gotten buried in my file so um, it's one that I have ready to present and I just ask that we could get it turned around to the business owner tonight um, it was a conditional use to allow a structure with multiple businesses, more than four, in the downtown business district. And like a lot of other projects, that's been slowed up significantly. Um, retail kind of slowly went under due to COVID and everything. So I'm not sure how many of you were present on the board when this was actually approved. So if we need to table all of the findings of that call, this one included until next month, that's perfectly fine. No, I would. Since we're having difficulties, do you want to just kind of table all of these to next month? I think that's best. <clears throat> so we will go ahead and table the findings of that all. A through E, do I need to read all those? No, and actually it's going to be A through D and then A through D. Okay, oh, A through D. And Jamila was, uh, had a question about um, swearing in uh, Amy Parker. Okay. Jeff, is that something we need to do tonight? She's been appointed. I, we still need to have her take the oath. I, I could do that with, I think I have, her, have Amy's email. I'll contact her at a good time and I'll just walk her through that. She, she has been uh, officially appointed, so she's a, in good standing. I, I always like to do the oath to be doubly sure, but it doesn't need a delay tonight. Thank you. So Amy Parker, Jeff Parker, So this petition was brought to us originally in 
January for the falls at Pendleton. It was developed uh, by um, Coronado Homes back in 2008. It was when the approval was granted, but they only started um, putting the infrastructure and the pavement and getting the lots ready here uh, in 2018. Um, more recently, Silverthorne Homes has taken over construction of those homes on those lots, and they found that a lot of their models don't fit on the uh, lot sizes, which are, um, I think the minimum lot size is 9,000 square feet or so, somewhere in that range. 30% um, is the maximum lot coverage that our uh, building ordinance allows, which means the building and the driveways can't take up over 30% of the lot coverage. On a 9,000 square foot lot, that starts getting pretty tight, especially when you're putting a big ranch style on it. So that's why they've come to us tonight for a variance in that lot coverage. And that would, um, the, the requested lot coverage increase would be up to 50% for all of the lots in the subdivision. Um, we have received some feedback from neighboring residents, uh, as well as um, residents of the falls future residents. Um, so I, I know one of the concerns that I received from the uh, resident on 132 was um, they, were, they were concerned about the closeness of the homes and um, the increased lot coverage, meaning uh, increased uh, fire danger presence or public safety issues. Um, also, they were curious to know what the situation would be with the uh, landscape commitment that had been made back in 2008, which would have provided kind of a landscape screen along the back side of those homes for the falls. And that is something that we have a plan for, um, but no timeline exactly on when that would be put in. And you said there is a plan? There is a plan. Yes, Rachel and I worked with uh, Coronado's surveyor to develop a landscape plan, um, which I believe Caitlin has developed and put in her uh, presentation. She's included in her presentation. Uh, Caitlin is a doffer of a gopher. gopher thank you. Yeah. Of uh, Silverthorn um, is representing this petition tonight. Um, now, last month there have been concerns about um, Coronado signing off on the petition. Um, and Caitlin, that has been, that's been fixed, is that correct? Correct, we sent um, that authorization to staff last month. Thank you. It seems like forever ago, it was before our last snowstorm. All right, so um, Caitlin, without um, you know, much more going over of the uh, request that we presented back in January, um, I would like to I'll turn it over to you if that's okay with um, with our board. Okay with you guys. Okay. All right. Uh, Caitlin, do you want to share your screen or do you want me to pull up your presentation? Um, go ahead and pull it up if you can. Okay. Wish me luck. <laughs> All right, perfect. Okay, um, well, hi everyone. I'm Caitlin Dofer, Entitlement Manager for Silverthorn Homes. Thank you for having us tonight. Um, I'll try and keep this short and sweet, but I do wanna go over just some details of the project um, so we have a better understanding of why we are asking for this variance. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, we are Silverthorne Homes. Uh, we have been a local Indiana business for over 25 years now, and we are proud that uh, it is our mission to build great neighborhoods and homes for people to celebrate life. 
Um, we offer 11 floor plans currently. We just added uh, four additional ones to our lineup um, that we're very excited about. And in 2018, we became a Berkshire Hathaway company. Next slide, please. Uh, for a location of uh, the project, we are located just northwest of Town Center off of Old State Road, um, and the site is about 20 acres. Next slide, please. The community features uh, 56 lots, all single family. Um, currently, we have a lot of lots on hold right now because of the lot coverage issue, uh, which we will discuss in more detail shortly. Next slide, please. And to give a little more timeline um, and context to the project, uh, like Kayla mentioned, uh, the architectural standards were approved in 2007. Uh, and then a variance um, was introduced along with the primary plot in 2008. And that variance was to reduce the lot sizes um, unfortunately, and according to staff, um, it does appear to be an oversight that when the lot sizes were reduced, the lot coverage was not increased. So the buildable area then was also reduced um, with those lot sizes. In uh, 2018, Coronado began land development um, of the community. And also in 2018, Silverthorne Homes came in and agreed to buy developed lots from Coronado. Next slide, please. And a little bit information on Silverthorne Homes. Like I mentioned, we have 11 floor plans, both single and two-story floor plans that range from 1,800 to 3,300 square feet. These are just base floor plans. So those sizes increase if you add on uh, sunrooms, um, other bump outs, lofts, basements. Um, and then included features include uh, nine foot ceilings, all hardy plate siding um, and additional garage storage in our garages as well. Next slide, please. And here's some variety of the different floor plans and elevations we offer. Um, architectural styles range from Tudor to Craftsman, traditional and farmhouse. Next slide, please. The community does come with architectural guidelines um, and those include having a consistent architectural theme throughout the community, uh, hip and gable roof styles, uh, fiber cement siding and masonry siding, there's landscape packages, um, anti-monotony codes, uh, minimum uh, square footage sizes, uh, 1400 square feet for a single story, 1800 square feet for a two story. Um, and while storage sheds are allowed in the community, uh, homeowners need written permission from the developer and the sheds have to be constructed using similar building material as the home. Next slide, please. And our CCRs, uh, they are pretty standard, but I do want to point out um, a couple that are uh, more tailor-made to this community. Um, no trampolines or playhouses, no above ground pools, and no uh, basketball goals or sports equipment. Um, and those are really tailor-made to um, empty nester communities or communities where you have more um, established families or established home buyers uh, with older children. And so this fits really well in the community because it is smaller at 56 lots, it's more of an enclave. Um, and so we've had a lot of buyers come through who are empty nesters looking for those ranch style home plans. And that is what has brought us here today uh, because the ranch floor plans um, are more expansive being on one story. They tend to take up uh, more of that lot coverage. And so we have had a few uh, home buyers who unfortunately have been held up by the lot coverage. Um, and next slide, please. To dive a little deeper into that and um, sort of what the situation is, looking at the lot sizes, um, a typical lot is 72 feet wide by 133 feet deep, which gives us a little over 9,500 square feet of lot. At a 30% lot coverage, that gets us a little over 2,800 square feet that can be covered by impervious surface. 
Um, the town defines impervious surface as including the, the garage, the driveway, sidewalks, patios, um, anything that is not grass essentially or landscaping. Um, so taking away the typical size of a driveway from that 2,800 square feet and a typical garage size, that leaves us with just a tad over 2,000 square feet of impervious surface or actually of the house. Um, and then you subtract a private sidewalk too that typically leads from the driveway to the front door. You're left with a 2000 square foot house that you can have at maximum. Um, and that does not include, next slide please. That 2000 square feet does not include options such as adding a tandem garage or having a third car garage option because the CCR say you can't have your trash bins outside, so you need that extra garage storage. Um, having a patio in the back because the CCR say you can't have your grill um, within view, so you got to put it on a patio in the back. Um, if you're big in your, into entertainment, you can't do a patio extension. Um, you're limited on the bay window options. Can't add that or sunroom options. Um, and then most home buyers, once they move in and start to get settled in, they like to make the place their own. And so unfortunately with the lot coverage as it is today, um, they can't do post-closing customization. Um, they can't do any you know, cool outdoor kitchens or patio features um, or in-ground pools. It's just unfortunately really limiting. Next slide, please. Uh, the two plot plans on the left are real life examples of homes that home buyers have chosen. And unfortunately, um, they've been held up um, in the review process because of uh, the lot coverage. Uh, the two plot plans on the left, or the far left one, uh, that lot coverage is at 36.9%. The middle one is at 33%. Yep, just for reference. And both of those meet all the other development standards. Um, they meet the side setback requirement, the rear setback requirement, um, and the front setback requirement. They just got held up on the lot coverage. The plot plan on the far right is an example of what does comply, uh, just for comparison. Looking at the lot coverage today, which is a maximum of 30%, um, if this variance were not passed tonight. Unfortunately, what we would be left with um, would be our ranch arbor homes. Um, and Ashton is just an example. It's 1,400 square feet, and it does meet the lot coverage uh, maximum at 23.8%. Um, and while the Ashton is a great floor plan, it lives great. Um, it's not what this community was intended to offer. And it's certainly not what uh, Pendleton would expect in this community. Next slide, please. And for an apples to apples comparison, um, the left plot plan is that Ashton plan again, uh, which complies with the lot coverage. And then on the right is the Jefferson floor plan, um, which is one of our most popular floor plans it complies with the side yard setback requirement, which is 10% of the lot width. It complies with the 30 feet minimum rear yard requirement. The only thing it doesn't hit is the lot coverage and it's at 35.7% lot coverage. Uh, next slide, please. And to further explain why we are asking for a 50% lot coverage, um, even though this example, we have a 35.7% law coverage, that is just the base floor plan of the Jefferson. And it does not include our most popular options that only increase the impervious surface from there. So our most popular options are uh, the traditional elevation for this floor plan, which adds on a porch, um, adding on a third car garage, extending the rear uh, covered patio, um, 
and then adding a patio um, on top of that too. All of those increase uh, the lot coverage. Um, so that is why we are asking for the 50% the lot coverage today to allow for that flexibility, not just with our home buyers that we're selling to today, but post closing as well. Next slide, please. And uh, landscaping was also mentioned. This is the entryway landscaping. Um, would like to hear your feedback on this um, and see if there's any um, additional commitment we can come to with the landscaping that everyone would be comfortable with. Um, but that's um, pretty much wrapping up my presentation tonight. Um, thank you for listening and happy to answer any questions or comments you have. Caitlin. Um, I do have some questions in regards to, I understand the new models are at 36 and 33, um, but you did mention the additional, um, you know, changes that could occur. But when you mentioned some of those, those would change the size setbacks, correct? No, the side setbacks are, um, it, it, they stay with the plat. So there are minimum side setbacks, which are the 10% of the lot width, and that would not change with the lot coverage. Okay. So when your customers are, are planning the third car garage, um, you know, the porches, how does that change any of the setbacks? The, the minimum setback requirement itself does not change. Okay. When you mentioned the landscape commitment, that was for the entryway. Is there anything included for a buffer? between your addition and the pines? Um, I, I was not aware that that was a concern, but I'm certainly open to hearing ideas for that. That's been one of the and I, and I mentioned that um, in that last meeting, when we had variances, um, there was the neighboring addition of Hurt uh, Glen. Um, of course, they have a different layout because they're shared spaces um, and different types of drainage. There was also some commitment to buffer between their neighborhood and what they had joined to with the Pines. Now, however, everything that it joins to the pines, those lots are actually similar in nature, so they, they change those. Um, so I'm just, I'm looking at um, comparison and wanting to make sure decisions are consistent. Um, what we've previously done, because then that affects what we do moving Overall density would not change. We are not proposing any additional homes on the site. We would stay at 56 lots. Caitlin, I believe in the meeting in January when we were discussing the details uh, on the occupancy, occupancy of the lots, I, I believe you brought up that you thought that you could get by with 40%. Correct. Is that still the case? That would be bare minimum, um, just the base floor plans. And I believe that goes back to 
um, if you go to slide 14, um, where we were looking at the Jefferson floor plan, which is one of our most popular floor plans, and that has a lot coverage of 35.7%. Um, and that doesn't include our most popular options, which add to that square footage. So that would be uh, the front porch, a third car garage, uh, patio extensions, all of those bump you up above that 40%. Okay, so what flat coverage would the uh, traditional elevation with the extended covered rear patio, do you know what that would be at? I believe it would be closer to 45%. One of the concerns with lot coverage um, as a topic for zoning ordinances and planning departments across the nation is um, stormwater management. Um, how would you propose to, um, I guess, make sure that stormwater uh, still has an area to go to and is properly managed um, as part of the development of up to 50% of the lot? We've consulted our engineers and um, they've assured us that the increase in lot coverage would have a negligible impact on the drainage of this project. Would, um, there's a 20 foot drainage and utility easement along the rear of these lots. Uh, I know that's also outside the building setback um, line uh, because these lots have a 30 foot uh, however, there is also room for the placement of um, sheds or accessory buildings, and like we talked about, uh, potentially in ground pools um, and patios. However, in that um, easement space, what sort of development do you foresee being allowed by the HOA? Um, sorry, just to clarify, are you asking about development within the easement? Yes. Are you allowing fences to be placed in the easement or sheds or anything like that? I believe fences would have to allow for water flow. So they could not be 100% privacy fence. But other than that, I don't believe anything could be placed inside the easement. Thank you. So the 30 foot um, on the, there's a 30 foot building setback requirement on all of these lots. And then a 20 feet of it is in a drainage and utility easement. So there are underground utilities. Um, you know, it's really more stormwater utility and it's more drainage utility on most of the lots. So most of theirs are from the houses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because some are offices in that area. Okay. We do have uh, some residents here tonight on this question. Is there a question for them? Yeah, we'll hear from them as everyone's kind of processing and coming up with some other thoughts here. Hello, thank you for letting me talk. My name is uh, Chris Boots. I'm a lifelong resident of Pendleton. I've served on the school board for 13 years. Um, very active in the community, owned a business in Anderson, um, and now uh, I'm in the real estate business. So <laughs> we are also residents of uh, the Falls, where we're born, and just moved into our home a week ago. Um, and we've had a great um, experience with Silver Corn and building. Uh, we, we have a larger lot uh, that's 103 feet wide which is a little wider than the example. So one of our dreams is to put an in-ground pool in, and that's been from the very beginning. We looked at lots of neighborhoods, not only in Pendleton, but other communities as well, and wanted to stay here at home. So uh, part of the ordinances are that we could put an in-ground pool in. And now with the 30% lot coverage, um, that kind of puts our dream of putting a pool in jeopardy because we're going to be right at 30 or even a little more in 30 just to have a pool. And probably our lot is going to be with 30% coverage. 
message, even if we can get it in, our lot is probably going to be one of two that could even accommodate an in-ground pool, just because of the setback from when we have a very narrow space in the back that we can even put a pool. Um, as a homeowner in the community, I, you know, I, I don't think that this um, this uh, Kaylin, maybe you can answer this, but I don't think that a 50% lot, lot coverage is out of the ordinary for a neighborhood. I don't believe, and I believe that, uh, I think Terry Glenn, just north of, north of us, has, has a 50% lot coverage, and those lots are much smaller, and so those homes are really close together compared to what we're going to have in the fall. So I um, would encourage the DVA to, to pass this, and I, I would do so in, in the fact that if uh, Silverthorne you know, can't build homes in there, then we're gonna have a lot of empty lots. And from a realtor standpoint, to have empty lots um, is not good for our property values. And as a school board member, you know, our school system really is a selling point for our community. And you know we have the largest, our school system has the largest number of new homes that are gonna be built in the school system of any other place in the state. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> um, so we wanna make sure that we attract the right people you know, in the neighborhoods. And uh, we want to be, we want Silverthorne to be um, on equal playing ground with its competitors you know, as we try and attract people to our neighborhood. I don't know if you have any questions for me as far as that goes. Jenny and I have talked, we had coffee a few weeks ago, so she's extremely knowledgeable. So. <laughs> yeah. But thank you. Thank you. Yep. I do have one question, if that's okay. Sure. The lots that are smaller in the addition, do you have concern if they went 50% how they're going to appear? Um, as far as the whole addition and how it's going to make it look? Yeah. Um, I, I don't. Do you, of course? Um, I don't, only because I think the price point that we're at, my concern would be more what Caitlin brought up, that if we, we have the outer lots, what are, are sold now, with the silver core model, and then, and, and I'm not saying anything against their armor models, those homes are beautiful too, but they are too different. They're very different. So to to suddenly all the people that have already purchased and have moved in and we have the silver thorn models, which are a, a little higher end, and then you're gonna come in and say, Oh well no, so now we've got to finish all the rest of it with these models that aren't in the same playing field. I, I don't think that's fair to the homeowners who are already there. Um, and I think if we're if we're shooting or an upper scale neighborhood of, like Caitlin said, 56 home lots, um, I think we need to continue um, with what was started. I think that would be the right thing to do for the community, um, especially um, when it comes time when people are ready to, you know, do resale, to, to move you know, somewhere else, because we are empty nesters. So we do plan on, you know, being there for a while, um, and we are in a different place. And I think, like Caitlin said, that's kind of what they were shooting for when they started this neighborhood. Do I have anyone else here that wants to speak? Do my board members online have any questions right now? Yes, can you hear me okay? We can, Jamal. Okay, uh, what is the average uh, lot size in this neighborhood? Like, what's the range? It varies pretty drastically. And really, Caitlin could probably provide better information on this. Um, but some of the lots are big pie shaped lots that go all the way up the property line. So some of them are over 14,000 square feet, others are considered 9,000 the minimum. I believe so. Caitlin, could you shed some light on that? Yeah, you're spot on. Um, it goes all the way up to 14,000. Um, and then our smallest ones, like I mentioned, are 72 by 133. So just a little over 9,500 square feet. Can you give me that range in acreage? In acreage? Um, 
I can calculate it real quick if you want to give me a second. So the 9,576 square feet is 0.22 acres. Okay. And 14,000 square feet is 0.32 acres. So you mentioned you had several, you have several people that are holding lots right now. Are, are they interested then in these larger plans? Like they want a three car garage and they want to build out in the back? The, the people that I'm aware of are interested in the ranch floor plans specifically because they do not want to deal with stairs um, either for health reasons or because they just like the open concept floor plan of a ranch better. Um, but that that is the hold up right now are the ranch floor plans. So if they don't, if this doesn't get approved, would you say that they would just cancel and move on to another neighborhood? I can't speak for them, but it's certainly likely. And you're finding a big demand for three car garages right now with these empty nesters? Uh, yes, they want the extra storage. Um, not only for trash bins and other, um, you know, yard maintenance supplies, um, but for, for hobbies, um, you know, for, for the seasonal boxes that you use. It's just everyone always likes extra storage. I'm sorry, there was a little bit of feedback. Could you repeat that? Did you send this letter to the residents at the falls? Or sorry, not the falls, but the pines? Uh, what letter are you referring to? Oh, I'm sorry, it was the um, falls home buyer's letter. Yeah, we received uh, three letters from home buyers, um, and those were were sent to you guys, I believe, last month. Have, have the Pines residents that um, use lots had been notified? Um, Caitlin, you can verify this, but anybody within 300 feet of the Falls subdivision, including the residents in the in the Pines. They've been notified, correct? Yes. You got the green Okay, okay. Excellent. And I know the folks on old 132 received notice because we did hear from um, at least one of the owners. Something um, we could look at, uh, something that we've um, done a little bit of research on lot coverage. Um, lot coverage, um, having a Negative impact on storm water infiltration is one reason we have lot coverage um, standards. Another uh, way to look at this, uh, the tonnage of the lot that we want to be taken up with house or two story or one you know, whole story structure. Uh, our current uh, definition of lot coverage, to be precise, includes the building area as well as the driveway parking area. So according to that now, you could say that uh, our new PBO is looking more at all impervious areas, but a swimming pool, for example, would be exempt from that definition. You guys would probably be okay. Um, however, if you wanted to put a larger shed in your backyard, that could be, you know, that could easily go over that 30% um, or any lot coverage requirement. Um, so that is one thing to look at. And I guess what that gets at is an emphasis on outdoor living uh, hardscapes. So if you did want to choose to grant this variance, um, you could do so with a condition that perhaps the building itself 
would only take up so much of that space and the remainder would be in the horizontal hardscape like patio improvements, uh, outdoor living space, things like that. So that is an option and if you're granting of this variance, you can always approve with modifications or if you think 45% would, would do it, then that would be another way to look at it. So there are a couple ways you could go with this. Um, we talked about some of that last time. Um, we just needed to understand the floor plan, the rest of the floor plans that are in this collection are filled. A factoring against this position would be the fact that there are no common areas for drainage at all in, a, in easements. And I think that's what people are confusing. Um, Carrot Glen is um, because they don't see the full picture, um, but it was approved um, with the type of variances because it's really not like any other subdivision Pendleton has ever had with the shared common spaces, um, very large retention ponds for that stormwater drain. Um, so it was designed because the areas with the homes were more dense, but the rest is not. Um, so that's why those decisions were made. And I think for record, we need to make sure that we're consistently keeping this matrix up and that we understand why things were approved in such a condition. So that's kind of a, a standalone that every lot that touches the piney from Carrot Glen, those are similar in nature to Deerfield of the Pines. And there's a buffer within that. Um, area where there's a landscape commitment um, that the joining neighbors approve um, with the developer. Um, so there were some other things in, in that decision making. Um, and I understand the predicament um, but another thing for everyone's understanding is this 30% was in place at the time when or it's been 30%. So I would have thought that the collection of homes that could be built would have been looked at prior and, and, and again, this in negotiation. And I understand the predicament we are in now, which is unfortunate to our, our residents, but we also have to think of. Um, but I just want to be clear that this isn't a Pendleton thing that we're pushing. These ordinances were in place prior to any acquisitions. Um, so I, I just want that record there to be clear. Um, so some of the things that have been um, satisfied, so I can go through that list for my, my board members here. So Coronado has signed off on authorization. We have a commitment for the entry landscape, but there has not been a decision for any buffer between this subdivision and um, Pines for neighbors because when this came into play, um, having this 50% lot coverage was not part of that. So we still have that issue. Um, we have the issue of whether we want to go 50% or do the 40% with the additional 10 as the outdoor um, areas. 
in Stillwater, from what I'm hearing, we have something on record stating that is not an issue. Correct. Correct. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, board members, have I left anything else off of that list for today's presentation? We've, we're making side and rear setbacks. Sir, I'm sorry. I don't remember your name. Chris, have you laid out in your property that if you would put the pool in the backyard, how many square feet that would take? Well, it, it is an, it's right at 30%. It is on for your total? Yes. Total lot coverage? But we have, we have, a, we have a large lot. Yes. So, like I said, ours is 103 feet wide. We're yes. going to 70 or whatever. Yeah. Do we have any time here from the adjoining neighborhood? Or just our letter? Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to make sure I've gone through everything that. Mm -hmm. If I could add a comment about the 40% with the additional 10% outdoor, mm -hmm. if that would be all right. Yes, go ahead, um, If you go to slide 12, where we referenced um, two existing homes that were on hold because of the lot coverage, um, and the far left one does not have a third car garage and it still exceeds the lot coverage maximum. Um, so it's at 37% right now. Um, if you add that third car garage, it would probably easily um, go above that 40%. The 40% the lot coverage that I did mention in January, um, that is just our base floor plans. All of those would be under 40%. But once you start eating, once you start to add on the third car garage options or our sunroom options, um, while those are not considered outdoor, they would um, exceed the 40% cap. So we would really be limiting what our buyers can choose um, as well as the potential um, assessed value of the homes in this neighborhood. And you said it's the middle one that would exceed? Uh, the, the far left one. Oh, the far left, okay. Are there other lots in the neighborhood that this would fit on uh, without exceeding that lot coverage? Uh, I don't know that for sure, um, but I do know our buyers choose the lot they want first. Um, and then the floor plan or vice versa. It really depends on um, what they uh, value the most in their home buyer, buying journey. Is this on a center lot or an exterior lot around the outer loop? Um, it looks like this is probably one of those center lots. Um, it's the 72 foot wide by 133. Has there been a consideration of um, potentially replotting the neighborhood to create larger lots? Um, it, it would not be at this time because um, land development has already taken place. So all of the utilities are in um, with the, the current uh, plot plan in mind. How about creating deeper home plans that take up more of the backyard? Would that um, solve any problems or could you put any more space um, on top of the garage, say with bonus rooms to take up less of the lot area? We do have loft options that can go above the garage, but it doesn't change the actual uh, first floor uh, floor plan and that footprint. I do know that there, there are residents that are waiting to buy. As a matter of fact, there's a family that's from Pendleton. They live in Florida. And they have purchased a lot and can't get it. They're getting very frustrated, I know, because they got this home and they want to move back to Pendleton, but can't because, because of this issue. And there are other, there are other people that are 
is frustrating with that. Just not being able to get this cut. And I should point out there are some other issues as well with this neighborhood because the stormwater infrastructure has not been completed. This neighborhood is currently limited to 20 lots um, available for development total, which has increased the pressures. It's kind of pushed the lot coverage folks to the bottom of the list probably because if you have a plan ready to go, it's probably built out there already. So oh, is the stormwater taken care of? Not yet, but I believe it's very close. We are making some progress. And so that situation, will that also accommodate what we're looking at here? It won't change things. Um, as soon as the limit on the lots are lifted, um, then whatever you guys decide will fall into place. But just to let you know, that is another factor that is pressuring um, the lot owners right now. Yeah, so it's not just this issue, it's the whole that is because drainage wasn't properly developed. It's also, has also slowed things down. Which is frustrating because 21 years ago, it was approved. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, the town was small enough we didn't, we didn't have departments to know to, <laughs> which is really an issue with the town as opposed to what's going on right now. Well, there have been a lot of stormwater um, yeah. legislation yeah. Um, yeah. pushed through. So that's not just the town. Right. Exactly. That's, we have to listen to the state on those things. Yeah. And see, we have, we are, Closing with delay because, as Ava said earlier, that the lots were replotted um, from the original, and we had a manhole in our driveway. So the infrastructure was already, you know, in place. The lots were replotted, and nobody thought to check that there was a manhole right in the middle of the driveway. So Silverthorne had to pay to have all of that completely redone, and you know it. It cost us a thousand dollars additional on our closing because our interest rate would say extend our payoff. Maybe that's or bigger. I would have to look. What mm -hmm. happened? Actually, let me. Um, somebody had a question. I don't yeah, want to continue on without listening to the artist. I was only going to say if we are the ones that are waiting to build, we have purchased, we have bought the lot. We cannot sell our house because we're waiting two months. It's very hard. I am one of the kind that has health issues. I have rheumatoid. I cannot do stairs. So I have to do a one story home. I believe one of the letters that you referred to is silent, but that was one that I wrote. I've, I've read them all. Yeah. So we are waiting. And it's very frustrating, but we're trying to be patient. And, and, and I thank you guys for being patient with us as well, because we have to look at our record. We also have to look at previous decisions that were made because of the set. Um, and then this decision ultimately affect future decisions because it's not perfect, right? So we're really having to take all the factors in place um, for some unfortunate oversights. Um, there's delays that don't deal with this from water, but are just, it, it's a very layered, um, complicated situation, so. We want to do the right thing too, because this not only affects this affects neighbors around, and it also affects future decisions. Um, so we have to be very mindful of all those factors. We know what the lot coverage is for here too. It is thirty percent, and uh, over time, some of those have. Uh, a little over, um, but most of them are before at 50 percent. And that's a very similar. Most of those lots are 9,000, uh, mm -hmm. um, not the upper, which is considered 
very similar, I think, um, 9,000 to the feedback, I think it's still kind of. Mm -hmm. um, That's part of my concern is not today, but 10, 15 years from now. If things slip, you know, in additions and things change, and I just don't want you to have a an area that you're not going to be proud of. Now, some things can be Many additions have to have permits where in the past they did not, correct? As far as coming to the town to get a permit um, for the outdoor areas that get built. That's correct, yeah, especially with mini barns, things like that. Yes, so then we would know if someone who is at 50% and then is adding beyond later on. Correct. I guess another item to look at would be the HOA structure at the ball to ensure some level of drainage easement care mm -hmm. and um, things like that. Currently, all of the uh, all of that drainage either sheds off it, it goes into some gutter systems in a central dry detention area that are then taken into the balls pond, which is owned by 12 different lot owners over there. Yep. And there is no HOA, I believe, in place there. There is not. So that, they bear the financial burden of this entire neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Being drained mm -hmm. into it. Yeah. Uh, Caitlin, what's the HOA setup? Um, with the falls, like how are they going to make sure that storm water that does, like their storm water drainage detention area does stay in good shape so that this 50% lot coverage is good there um, and then is like maintained well over to the pines and isn't problematic in that neighborhood. I mean, I know we're getting into the weeds on this, but I'm just trying to find ways that we can justify, uh, you know, increased lot coverage. Um, and also ensure that we're going to have a really well maintained drainage system. Sure. So again, our engineer team has looked at this and the, the change in lot coverage is going to have a negligible impact on the drainage of this community. As far as looking at uh, continued maintenance, um, I believe much like our other um, HOA setups, um, we I believe we partner with um, other companies to ensure that everything is in compliance and, and up to date and working well. Um, so it would just um, fall in line with what all of our other communities do as far as the HOA. Does that mean occasional maintenance of that easement? Um, or, you know, can you commit to any sort of I guess maintenance of those easements, insurance that they are not being impeded. Um, what, I guess, can you, what do you propose to this HOA to like to allow for this variance? I want to move things along because I know we're coming to the, we're, we've been you know at this for over an hour now, so I'd like to get on our next petition if we have time or. Um, I, I guess I'm not exactly sure how to work it into the HOA as a commitment, um, other than just what state guidelines are already and making sure that everything is in compliance. Um, the construction plans as they are currently approved and making sure that it meets those. Um, I guess that's the only thing I can think of. This drains into that that pond. There's a lot more houses right now with construction. Um, that tends to to drain a lot of other stuff, um, mud things get into that retention pond, so that needs dredged more. Have, have there been discussions regarding that? 
Um, if there has been, it I would have not been involved in it, um, but it's certainly something I can look into. On some of these lots, I know you allow your buyers to select them. Do you label some that they certain house plans can or cannot be be built on some? I'm sorry to make sure I understand. You're asking if we can limit floor plans on some lots. I guess, how would we determine the limitation? Based, based on the lot coverage. So you might, some of your smaller lots, some of your largest floor plans with the lot coverage might not be suitable. So prior to selling those, you would know certain models aren't going to fit on certain lots. Yeah, the answer to that is yes. Scott Beck, the salesman, he, he has a spreadsheet that he has the lots and lot homes that fit. Okay, on. so it's not a free for all. I want this oh. lot, and then regardless no, of. We had to change no. lots. We okay. had to change lots because of the house we wanted would not fit on. Okay. So that just hasn't been stated, I don't believe. So that's also something. Okay, but most of those are, I'm sorry, most of those that the people want, but these people, they want a, a one-story ranch and can't, can't do the two-story, so because of that. So most, Caitlin, most of the, the selection are two-story. And the court selection, if your selection of homes to select, most of them are two-story and not Caitlin, can you hear us? Barely, I'm sorry. Um, we have we have four ranch floor plans currently, and I believe eight two story. Okay. Do my board members have any other questions? Ella, did you just say no? Correct, I said no. Amy? No, she's not here right now. Okay, and Scott Beck did uh, post a couple things in chat. He said that um, the drainage issue between, uh, it's completely separate, it's between Pendleton and Coronado. Please do not try to group these together. Um, yes, we have been completely transparent during the sales process. The buyers believe our product and craftsmanship are worth taking a chance on the opportunity. And Scott Beck works for Silverthorn, not for Coronado. Um, Jeff Graham, do you have anything to add on this from um, your perspective as our town attorney? I mean, should we stay out of that entirely or? Well, um, I do have a couple uh, questions, I guess, and I won't keep uh, you long. The petition itself, um, that was filed and we, we require our petitioners to, uh, ex for instance, the strict application of the terms of the zoning ordinance will result in the practical difficulties and use of the subject property. Explain why this statement is true in this case. And um, <clears throat> can someone from the petitioner explain why, um, why there are practical difficulties with this lot other than, is it just com commercial feasibility? Is that safe to say that's the main reason? I would say the practical difficulty is there was a variance that was approved um, more than 10 years ago that reduced the lot size, but there was an oversight that it did not increase the lot coverage. So it did not proportionally um, allow the same size home that would have been built prior on a larger lot to still be built on this lot. Um, and so that's that's kind of why we're here today. We consulted with staff who agreed that it was an oversight 
they suggested that we apply for a 50% variance, which is why we um, requested that. We can go down to 45%, um, but that is our practical difficulty is that we have floor plans um, that meet the architectural standards um, and that are desired floor plans, but unfortunately they don't uh, meet the lot coverage. Sure, so the, the town's previous action effectively created a uh, unsellable lot, non-commercially viable, and that was uh, due to an oversight both at the town and at the petitioner level. Correct. Thank you. Kevin, you said you could go to 45%? Correct. That would allow for our floor plans and the options um, while it would limit um, what homeowners can do after closing, um, it would it would allow us to sell all the homes that we need to. Any other questions? Anything from the audience? Okay, let me ask our one call in listener. I've also oh. invited anybody who's called in to um, to ask any questions at this time too. So please, if you're listening in. You can go to your chat function and respond to that. And I'll read your questions there. Um, let me ask our one call in listener, 765 208 8513. Do you have anything to say? Uh, if not, I'll just speak to you again. Hi, this is Lynn Watt, 765-620-8513. I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you. Yep. I don't have any uh, questions from any of the attendees. Um, I guess my one recommendation um, as staff is uh, if you if the board chooses to uh, move forward with uh, granting this variance, we need to make sure that that screen along 132 gets uh, included as a commitment. I do think that screening is important to the residents who originally um, you know came to this meeting back in 2008, um, and so if we can tie that in, that would probably be really helpful for some of the timely guidance. Apart from that, I, I leave it up to you guys. Um, I will ask for a motion for approval at 45% with additional 5% for the hardscaping with commitments on the old 132 screen, which also includes the entry. Yes. The entryway, the landscape. Um, I do want this on record that this is an anomaly situation um, due to past oversights. Um, we will in the future continue to look at our UDO and seek guidance from that. And we will also want the HOA to ensure um, that the, the easement area is maintained. So I will put that out and ask for a motion to approve. Ms. Sisson, are you going to also request that the uh, all the conditions called out in their presentation that you've been provided be complied with? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And then as far as the findings of fact that are required to be adopted, there are there are findings that were submitted by the petitioner. Would those be adopted as also as part of your invited motion? Yes, they will. Okay, thanks. Do 
Do I have a motion to approve as stated? Yes, I'll make a motion to approve as you stated. All right, Camilla. And I need a second. Do I have a second? There is no second, the motion would fail. We we do have an obligation to provide uh, the group with an answer to their variance. Now we can continue um, this matter to gather more information or we can craft uh, findings which deny the, the variance. But um, pursuant to state law, we do have to come up with an answer. It doesn't have to be tonight, but uh, just uh, throwing that out there, what our options are ultimately. Herbie or Amy, do you have anything to add? No, I'm, I'm just concerned about it going totally to 50%. Um, I think I can agree with the total of 45. That's what has been put out here to vote well, for. Then you added a 5%. For the hard state? Yeah, and okay. I, to me, I could go with a total of 45. Did you do 40% plus 5 or just the 45 plus? I would do the 40 plus 5. But some of those come. Amy, did you have any feedback? No. I'm still taking it in and learning. Okay. So the 40 plus five would not give you enough. It wouldn't give a lot of the new homeowners. Because she, I mean, that's what she said, that it would be over. Correct. The, the forty percent would not accommodate three car garages. No, I said forty-five percent. Forty-five percent. I'm sorry. What I understood was forty percent plus five percent for hard steeping. Yes, that was that was also mentioned. They were both mentioned. The the forty percent plus five percent for hard steeping would not accommodate the third car garages. Forty-five percent would accommodate the third car garages. And then. But everyone who builds eventually wants to add a small little patio. And that's why I put the 5% hardscape because it's flat and it's not vertical from a, a visual. Um, that's why I stated 45% would get that floor plan with that additional 5% if they want their little outdoor garden space. We can make that motion and see if it got through. You're welcome to make a motion. You can say that. Well, I would make a motion that with all the details that I've already been mentioned, we can put in the uh, motion as well. And the motion would go to a maximum of 45 percent. And would that include any? Um, hard state. Just My like motion that. is it's forty five percent. Do we have a second for that? Sorry, Ms. Kenny. Do we have a second for <laughs> Kirby's motion at forty five? Pat. Jamila, I think you're speaking, but I can't hear you. 45% total is not going to accommodate the garage and the third car garage. And it, it does accommodate a third car garage, but if the homeowners later on would want to add a small patio, the hardscape for barbecuing, um, then they would not have that additional room in the future. So that's and it would be pervious. Realistically speaking, I mean, those things are standard items now that people have in their homes. You know, they have some kind of patio or barbecue area. And 
third car garage is now becoming standard as well for storage or you know cars i agree So do we go back to the first motion? The first motion that Mila approved with all of those contingencies. Yeah, all we need is a second. And I just need a second on that or a second on Kirby's. Okay. I will make a second on Jamila's. Proposal. Okay. Amy Parker as second for the 45% with the additional five for the state with all the commitments listed uh, that we can be presented for the evidence. I call. We'll take a roll call. So, uh, Amy Parker. Yes. Kirby McCrossan? No. Lee Sisson? Yes. Did Elizabeth Barr? Yes. Okay, so the motion is approved for BO119202-01, which also registration as we previously stated there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. you guys are really stick around to the whole thing. We appreciate you. Yeah, thanks so much. You're welcome. Make sure I forget my set up That's right. <laughs> Secret. So we are. Thank you, everyone. We are at new business. Which is CU 0316200. 1-01-3104 West U.S. Highway 36, which is Fall Creek Corner. I'll turn that over to our presentation. All right, I might need to promote a couple people. Yep, I see him. He's already a panelist. Presentation. I have um, asked Mia for me to unmute his presentation and this evening. Hello. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to give a short introduction to the petition and then we'll turn it over to you. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, the conditional use this evening is at um, 3104 West U.S. Highway 36, Fall Creek Corners. Um, that site has recently been subdivided into three lots. Um, as most of you know, it's on US 36 between State Road 67 and uh, 300 West, which is the road that goes along the backside of um, the Needler's uh, grocery store. And, uh, and also uh, then crosses over and goes north at this point um, to the north across 36. Um, the proposed conditional use is a dollar tree. Uh, so the request is to build a, a dollar tree um, for the typical store on a corner lot there at 336. Um, discount store is considered a conditional use in the town of Pendleton. Anthony Coco is here tonight representing um, the applicant or Dollar Tree and the owner of the lot is Steve Hughes and I know he is listening in as well, or the owner of the development and 
Um, I know you still like you too. So you can read through here and see um, exactly what the answers are to the questions. Um, you know, this is why it's a conditional use. Well, it's a, it is a discount store is listed as, listed as a conditional use in the plan business design, uh, in the plan business zoning district. Um, all right, and they're stating that um, they will comply um, with uh, the UDO, that their conditional use will be harmonious and in accordance with the general objectives uh, of the comprehensive plan in the UDO. Um, they say this is true because the building design will include materials required by the town comprehensive plan and will smoothly flow with business. Uh, the proposed conditional use will be designed, constructed, operated, and maintained so as to be harmonious and appropriate in appearance with the existing intended character of the general vicinity and will not change the essential character of the same area. Explain why this statement is true. Uh, the building design will be designed, operated, and maintained to be harmonious to the surrounding area. Um, and they've gone on to the, the proposed conditional use will not be hazardous or disturbing to existing neighboring uses. Explain why this statement is true. Is retail dollar items that cannot present hazardous or disturbing uses. And these are all the kind of things that will show up in the mining spec. And that um, the approval of a conditional use like this could be mitigated with um, any conditions that this board chooses to uh, put in place along with approval. And so you can approve, approve with uh, modifications or deny. Those are three options available. The proposed conditional use will be served adequately by essential public facilities and services such as highways, streets, police and fire protection, drainage structures, refuse disposal, water and sewer, and schools, or um, that the people responsible for establishment of the conditional use shall be able to provide adequately any such services, which would be more the case in this case since it's a, a new bill. Um, subject property has been approved by proper authorities for entrances, drainage, water, and sewer. And that is correct. A limited site development plan was uh, approved by the plan commission. Um, so it, is, it has been preliminarily reviewed, all of the specific site plans for the Dollar Tree McMillan. So that's kind of the next step. All right, and um, it says it's not going to be, uh, you know, draining on the public expense because of any um, requirements or detrimental to the economic welfare of the community. Um, it does state that we'll have public restrooms. I don't know if that's, like, that's what we were getting at with that question, but we'll take it. Um, let's see. The proposed conditional use will not involve uses, activities, processes, materials, equipment, and conditions of operation that will be detrimental to any uh, person's property or the general welfare by reason of excessive reduction of traffic, noise, smoke, fumes, glare, or odors. Um, so it's a Dollar Tree, so it won't be um, doing a whole lot of that stuff. It's typical Dollar Tree use, no uses, processes, etc., detrimental to any person's or property. Because they're going to have a smooth transition from neighboring property uh, and public road. And that's, once again, we're not working with an existing entrance here. That's going to be new. So that will be uh, controlled by our right-of-way access, manage access management plan um, and reviewed by the planning commission as well as staff. Um, yep, there's really no um, natural scenic or historic features out there to worry about uh, damaging. All right, so that's the application. And I know those questions do seem a little bit tedious, but these are the kind of things that um, have to be answered in order to prepare a good finding of fact. Um, all right, um, I did include a couple uh, pictures of the store. I'm trying to separate out for you guys. And Jeff, let me know if I'm wrong in doing it like this. I'm uh, trying to separate out the uh, use from the site I think it's a given at this point that the site will comply with the uh, plan business design guidelines and our UDO. 
Um, so we're not here looking so much at materials or things like of that nature, more so as the use itself. Is that correct? Yes, that, that is correct. Now, it is somewhat, a, you are talking about conditional use, but it's definitely more toward the, uh, the development side as far as uh, what you're considering tonight. Thank you. So that back um, access that would hook on to, well, that, I, I can't remember, well, it's not considered town anymore, but um, that's not really developed well would be part of this decision? Um, well, the development of that, of the site itself and the access into the site, I think you could make a, a more general requirement, like um, if it's seen fit, there needs to be a turn lane or a passing blister there or some upgrade of the roadway uh, versus, um, you know, really looking at the site plan that is shown here tonight. I did want to pull it up just to show you guys what, um, you know, give you guys some idea of what the site will look like. So, uh, and Jeff, feel free to feedback on this a little bit. I'm trying not to get the two um, petitions we're going to see kind of mixed up. Um, but yeah, it will have to be in compliance with our driveway standards. Uh, yeah, Kayla, you're you're doing fine. I mean, that there's other th all other standards have to be complied with. Just because we grant this conditional use on the property doesn't uh, give them carte blanche to to ignore the other things like driveway standards. So I I think you're nailing it. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay. So um, I did look into a little bit why discount store would be considered a conditional use. Um, it seems that, um, I Googled it. I just looked it up, you know, kind of what, what was the thinking on this? And really a lot of communities have different ways of looking at it. Some communities are uh, very, very happy to get any sort of retail store um, in, a, in their community um, because it does provide at least some you know, basic uh, grocery, uh, groceries, household supplies, things like that, and really small towns that might not have any other retail. Um, however, other communities are um, kind of putting a hold on, do on dollar stores because um, they see them kind of taking the place of what maybe would be better served by a full service grocery store, um, not providing in food desert type areas. Um, not providing um, the range of the range of products that a typical grocery store, like fresh produce, things like that, would offer, um, but it's filling the void of a grocery store. Therefore, a grocery store is not going to come in. Anyway, we've got a grocery store across the street here. Um, it is our one full service grocery store in town, um, but it is, you know, it's serving us. Um, and I'm not sure totally what Dollar Tree is going to be offering is in terms of merchandise, but I did want to just offer you guys some background why this would be considered a conditional use. So I guess from a planning perspective, um, I, I do want to let you guys know that we are going to be holding them to the land business design guidelines. Uh, so that's a separate issue. Um, so a, a lot of small communities will have a whole barn type you know, like a Dollar General or something like that. Um, and it's just that there's no, there's not the same looking at the design guidelines as we're going to have. So in my eyes, I look at it as a building. I don't look at the name on the sign. Um, let's look at, this is a new building. Um, so we'll be reviewing that at Planning Commission. But the use itself, discount store, the dollar store is what we're looking at tonight. And that's kind of just a brief history. There is a, a Dollar General to the north, half a mile. Uh, once again, it's a very nice structure, complies with our plan business design guidelines. If our market, if for some reason, can't support uh, two dollar stores within half a mile of each other, then either one of these locations should be, I, I hate to speak about any business failing, sure. but the idea is we're gonna be left with a quality building that could be reused for some other type of 
when we do have um, growth. Um, so any landscape commitments that's not here, that's that's a plan? Um, yes. I'm trying to keep my stuff separated too. Okay. Now, one thing you could look at, I think it'd be totally appropriate, is screening between this, um, just ensuring that we're going to have a good buffer zone between this use and the residential use that is currently to the north. Okay. And um, do we have any residents? That have been notified or we have some here okay um, and I guess before I get too far I'd want to go ahead and allow Anthony to give his presentation and then yes yeah okay, okay. Yeah. Anthony would you want to go ahead and give us your presentation uh, I had asked Steve to do our uh, uh, presentation mr. Hughes oh. Uh, my my granddaughter's here and she's uh, uh, she's making a little noise. That's why I keep on muting uh, and muting. And then uh, uh, Courtney is also available for anything that might happen with the uh, uh, on the dollar uh, tree side. Okay, let me promote Steve to panelist. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Steve, can you hear me, or did I promote the right? Um, I see we've got Courtney. Hi. Yes. I'm here. See, we're getting some feedback. Yep. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Okay. Is that better? I can barely hear you on the meeting. I had to pull my phone up just to hear it. Okay. All right. So who would like to um, present the petition for Dollar Tree? Did we miss anything or do you guys have anything to add? I'm probably going to have to go back to my phone because I can barely hear you. Hold on one second. And Courtney, I guess, um, who are you? Are you representing Dollar Tree? Uh, yes, I, I'm representing Anthony Coke and his development along with Dollar Tree. And I am the uh, broker in the deal. And I'm happy to jump in. Um, I apologize. I know it's been about a minute or two since the first question came out. But uh, can you remind me what the first question is you let me address? Well, we'd really just like any additional information you'd like to add. Um, anything you have to say about the petition on, on why this is going to be a, a good addition to Pendleton? or if there are any downsides to this use that we should know about? Uh, yeah, sure. So, so let me dive, dive in into the first comment on the Dollar General being about uh, maybe a quarter mile to the north. Uh, dollar, I, I know a lot of municipalities look at dollar stores as one and the same, but the truth is that they are not. Uh, dollar Tree itself is a single dollar point, uh, single dollar price point item comparatively speaking to family dollar and dollar general. So uh, the majority of their items and the majority of their SKUs and their, their, their store uh, are going to be that single price point item. They're more tailored towards the gift cards, the kitchen utensils, the uh, balloons, the, uh, you know, uh, the school uh, supplies, things like that. They do run about 10 to maybe 12 or 15% of their store for uh, packaged goods, uh, grocery goods and things like that. But a lot of their inventory is allocated towards some of those more household daily supplies. Comparatively speaking to while Dollar General and Family Dollar do offer those services, ours are a single you know, price point item. 
Um, also, in addition, I would say from a aesthetic standpoint, uh, Dollar Tree probably offers the more aesthetically pleasing art, uh, building design and architectural design out of the three or any of its other competitors. Uh, as Anthony has pointed out in his uh, elevational renderings, um, we have noted that there is a three material uh, a point on the architectural design. We do, uh, we do show EFIS on the top portion of the building uh, with a split face block on the bottom portion of the building. Uh, we, also have, um, we also have a flat metal facade on the back three sides that simulates the EFIS design. So oftentimes what we face when Dollar Tree is proposing a new project in any new municipality, especially one that has architectural designs, we try to adhere to those as much as possible uh, without, uh, without compromising the budget. So Anthony and his team, along with our uh, other architectural uh, designers, have come up with a uh, multifaceted facade to kind of break up the architectural design to make some of the municipalities more uh, or to make the building a little bit more appealing uh, in the architectural review. So that is one thing that we have noted. And I think Anthony has noted that on page one and page certainly on page one. Uh, yes, on page one of the plans that you're showing right now. So as you can tell on the front page, uh, you know, we have EFIS on the top and the split face block on the bottom. On the back side, uh, we're showing that textured uh, metal panels, which emulate the EFIS on the three sides. Okay, we'll probably review those details more with the plan commission and our site development plan review. Um, sure. But, um, I guess, are you going to have uh, sidewalk connections that would foster pedestrian access to the site? Um, are you going to have um, uh, screening to the north where the residences are to make sure that, say, trash doesn't blow into uh, their yards and to make sure they don't have to look at the backside of any building or dumpster enclosures, things like, things like that? Sure. Yeah, we, we're proposing, if you go to the site plan um, on page two, I believe, of your presentation, uh, we are proposing a dumpster enclosure. Uh, one thing that is important to our client is uh, their 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 inventory is delivered in cardboard boxes that have to be broken down. They they're more inventory heavy than most retailers uh, because they are a lot of uh, single uh, because of the way things are delivered. So there is a lot of materials that are delivered to the dumpster and the compactor on a daily basis. And so they need that that position to be as close to the uh, delivery zone as possible for uh, minimizing employee uh, 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 to minimize the amount of employees have to walk. Um, their dumpster enclosures on this plan, we're proposing to uh, create a dumpster enclosure to mitigate the visibility between the properties to the north and on the property itself, so that there is uh, the least amount of trash exposed. Um, that would be that would be uh, allocated towards uh, the exit of the building, so that when the employees are coming out of the back of the building, they have the least uh, amount of distance to walk, and that would be fully enclosed. Um, what include? Well, and once again, we're kind of getting into the plan commission type stuff, but I guess. Um, is there any, going to be any sort of screening of the site in general um, to the north? Um, I actually cannot address that right now. I don't know if we have any berms or anything that is going to, that's going to buffer the visibility or sight line between the property uh, from the north, uh, between this property and the property to the north. I may have to defer to Anthony on that if he can chime in. Yeah, uh, that's where we were at. We had asked Steve to, um, you know, to be on the call because it, it was his plan to put uh, um, shrubbery across the back of it that'll uh, shield that from the uh, on the north side. Okay, and I know he has a he has got a, um, a landscape plan in development. I know so. Okay. Right. Can we ask our residents if they have any questions that they'd like to ask you? Sure. 
Hi, my name is Becky Perry, and I live at 7031 South 300 West. Um, I'm just north of the adjacent property. Uh, there's a mobile home, and then I'm just north of that in a little red brick house. Um, I really believe that I would want, and I know you guys said it would have to be with the planning commission, but I really think that this shrubbery would not suffice. Um, I think that, you know, shrubbery can die and then it won't get replaced. You know, as far as I think that it should be some sort of a permanent fence that would go down through that whole entire property, not just behind the Dollar Tree. I'd like to know, is the Dollar Tree going to be facing 36? Or is it going to be facing towards the new little coffee shop? And I didn't get one of those pieces of paper to show. <laughs> I didn't get one of those. So I don't know which way that that Dollar Tree is going to be showing. Is it going to be like that facing 36? Or is it going to be facing to the, it, to the west? Yeah, it, the, the, the entry is going to be facing 36 towards Needlers. Okay. As we as we have it shown on the site plan currently. Is there going to be any other entrances? No, uh, it, it's going to be a single point entrance for the customers. There will be a rear loading dock for delivery, but the main entrance will be face uh, will be on the south side of the building facing Needlers. So there will be a loading dock delivery for semis and trucks to come in off of three hundred. Uh, yes, that's correct. I was under the understanding there would not be an entrance off of 300 at the prior meeting I was at. We have, we because have, as traffic, we're showing. So much traffic all yeah. right between that property line and 36. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that point. I said that I thought that it was discussed because there was so much already traffic between that property line and 36 that that, that road is really used a lot uh, going north on you know coming out of the Dairy Queen coming out of the grocery store all of that going north there and I am kind of I don't well and and and, and, and I think I think part of so is it going to be a paved driveway into there? Yes, it is. Uh, yes, it is. And I so, think part of this discussion was going to include Steve, and I think Steve is having trouble uh, uh, checking in. But th this this plan also incorporates the rest of uh, Steve's uh, retail center and what he's proposing to do as well. So we we're hoping he could chime in on that, uh, which hints the reason why we have that access drive uh, to the right or the east side of the building as well. And once again, that would be that much better to have a fence along that whole entire way. Um, the whole entire length of that property. So, because there's going to be, uh, I was just going to ask, Caitlin, if in the past we've had where residents could help be a part of the discussion and what they wanted as a buffer. Can we do something similar like that? I do think that uh, it would definitely be the purview of this board to uh, include as a condition an increased, um, you know, buffer like like um, you know, yeah, more bigger shrubs screening and including a fence. I think that would definitely be up to you guys to include. Um, they will have to have typical uh, typical. Landscaping, anyway, since it's along a drive. Mm -hmm. um, however, you could go ahead and fit a step further and it require a fence um, or some sort of hard, uh, like a wall, something like that. Um, you see fit, yeah. There's that laid out. I feel bad it wasn't. Oh, that's, that's okay. And I also, and I know some of this goes to the planning part, and I just, I just been wanting to make sure that I bring it up. Where I can, yes, absolutely. You know, but um, I would hope that when they decide to make the drainage 
that it would go towards 36 and not go north because everybody knows there's already a drainage problem and water standing out there, you know, in that whole entire area. And I was told that they would have to have all three of the people that plotted this would have to go together and make a decision on the drainage. But I would really hope that they would make some sort of a drainage and a ditch if they're going to have that drive to the north. Um, some sort, because Mr. Cantrell here is going to really get dumped on with water, especially if they have that paved. You know, because I've seen it with the car wash. <laughs> I've lived there forever. <laughs> so, Kayla, is the drainage on the planning commission? Um, or do, can we again make that as part of the modification? Uh, well, as part, of the plan, as, as part of the planning commission, Judy, and reviewing that site plan, they'll be looking at uh, the drainage plan as well. So we'll have more of a set of plans to really review at that point. Okay. So at this point, um, what we can really say is, hey, it's going to be in compliance. We're going to work with the rest of the site to make sure they utilize that drainage easement that's up there at the north part of this lot. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, and that the site drains correctly um, into you know ditches along the roadway, so they're not flooding anything there either. And certainly, we wouldn't want it to flood residents to the north and you guys either right so um, that will be looked at okay so for the decision for tonight um, we we can add a modification regarding the landscape buffer um drainage will be on the planning commission clearly the aesthetics is on the planning commission i just want to make sure my board is clear so this is looking at the proposed conditional use that is compliant and went to the UDO at some site. Um, the limited site development plan, um, it will adhere to current drainage, but any details of that is on the planning commission. Um, it will comply with the access management plan um, yeah. hey, uh, Kayla, this is Courtney. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I, I was told that Ben has already reviewed the drainage on this. There are drainage easements and there's a plan for where that drainage will go. However, you guys, in your construction documents, we'll need to show how you're tying into that and okay. how it, you're going to, you know, make use of it basically and that it'll work. Um, because I know he wasn't probably dealing with your site uh, specifically, but yes, it was a general drainage plan for the entire site. Okay, thank you. And um, just to be heads up, I think we'll probably um, be interested if you guys can flip this uh, so that that other parking area is maybe speaking more to the existing shopping center and whatever is going to go on the other lot. And that way it'll create more of a shopping center feel. So say, somebody can go into this dollar store and shop and send, you know, their kid over to get pizza or a uh, cup of coffee. Um, and we know that, you know, Steve's site doesn't look like this anymore either. There is a drive through and especially after um, some other improvements, it's going to, I think it'll all speak to each other really nicely. So just be on the lookout for that. So we aren't approving that piece here though. That would be the planning commission as far as the change of the parking. Uh, that switch of the site yeah. orientation. Um, no, I don't think that would probably happen okay. tonight. Okay. Okay. So, do you have any thoughts on that, Courtney? Are we talking about the the orientation of the building in in relation to the parking field? Yes. Um, I cannot address that at this current time. Um, I can take it back to our engineers and have the conversation, but uh, no, I cannot address that right now. Okay. Yep. Well, I just. If you could do that, that'd be a great start for our planning commission. Um, it all goes well tonight. Did you have anything else? Okay. No, I, I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm, you know, if 
I know it's where I'm standing because of you know drainage and, and all you know. And and we, that we appreciate your coming, you know, yeah. and I, I'll continue to to be here. <laughs> yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, I I. I I, I can assure everyone that, that when it comes to drainage, uh, you know, we, we do multiple of these stores across the country, uh, including our developer, uh, Anthony, who's on the, on the call. And one of the things that we always address is drainage. We will make sure that we adhere to the drainage uh, requirements uh, and, and overflow on that. So that is one thing that we certainly will address. We'll also take a look at the building orientation. I do know that our client has taken a look at the current site plan and has approved it. That's one thing we will need to get approval on. But we will look at both uh, both of those items and uh, see if we can address questions and comments on that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so so are there any other questions on my board? Um, so as presented for CUO 316021-01, that is the Fall Creek Corner presentation, um, I'm going to ask for a motion with the landscape plan um, with the additional of Either a fence or a something beyond the um, just the, the shrubbery, um, and then the additional pieces that we've discussed here that go to the planning commission are a part of this, um, and this does meet. The conditional use and development plan, the, the additional drainage will be at the plan commission as well. Are you leaving anything out, Taylor? Um, nope. Well, I guess there was one other thing. Um, I think Steve might be able to talk now, but the one other thing um, that uh, I'm so sorry. You're fine. Too many buttons. Steve, did you have any questions before there's a, a motion or anything? Um, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Okay. I worked with uh, Reed Everett out of Fishers to design up an entire uh, landscape, including a fence that runs all the way from 67 all the way to 300. Okay. So I've already got that plan in place, and I can bring that by your office tomorrow. I'd say let's just, um, I'm glad, I knew you had something in the works, wasn't sure what exactly, so let's just make sure it's part of the site uh, site development yep. uh, plan, and we'll review it with plan commission. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Ben has already addressed the uh, drainage on the back of the lot, um, just north of where the Dollar Tree is going to be, there was going to be a dry well retention pond there, and I worked with uh, Scott Rusky to uh, create a plan to drain that across 300 into that field. Um, he was working with NDOT to, um, to uh, cover the, where that water was going. Um, he was trying to get it to run, um, was it east towards the um, creek that runs down through there. And, right. Thank you. Yep. And, um, I'm sorry, we're having a little bit of a difficult time here. And I think you're asking Courtney something, and he's he's got that uh, blank look on his face because we <laughs> we, we yep. couldn't it very well. But I, I think you were asking about uh, uh, going down 300. Is that what you? Yes, saying? yes. If there are going to be deliveries to that back uh, area, are you going to be allowing, like, creating a turn lane or expanding that roadway um, to that back entrance? 
from 300 or what are, what's going on to make sure that um, delivery trucks are going to be able to make it to that area? Well, we, we ran a, a WB67, which is, a, a as you know, just a site plan that uh, you put a truck on and, and see how the trucks are going to come in and out and make sure they're not running over any parking spaces or hitting the buildings or curbing or anything like that. And, and, and that uh, it, it's suitable for what we're uh, what we're using. They, they probably get about one or two trucks a week uh, in there. Uh, so it's not like there's a, a steady flow of trucks that, that come in and out. Up yeah, and addition at this point um, would be um, that if you know a sign is put up or something that truck traffic is not to go north on 300 at this point, but instead should go south to 36 and you know, do all their traffic right there since it is such a small road. Does that sound reasonable? There's a lot of trucks that still go up that road. A lot of trucks go up that road and turn. And that's a bad intersection. Yeah, and they don't because they don't want to make the turn hard turn on 67. Oh, okay. You know what I mean right there by Jimmy's they don't want to make that hard turn um, and maybe that would be something that NDOT could come up with if because if there would be a turn lane there on the 67 right there it would make a big big difference for the semis to be able to turn there but we have a lot of semis and dump trucks go up that road. Okay that's good to know. That could even be just like an internal, you know, sign on the site. And Kayla, isn't there a uh, plan in place to create a turn lane off of 36 onto 67 heading yes. north? Yep, that is in the plans. I was just out there for a meeting the other day, and I believe it will be uh, letting in, or, you know, allow for bid in 2022. So it's coming up. That, yep, okay. good idea. <laughs> I, yeah, I've lived on that lot for lots of years. <laughs> My dad's owned that since 1988. My dad built that building. 65. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the goal is to make it yeah work for all of us. Yes, so yes. I appreciate you coming to all these meetings. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I will ask if there's any other questions um, from the board from our presenters. Um, uh, oh, Zoom callers. Seats are only at ten okay. at this point. <laughs> I, I, I missed them earlier, so you know, this is a different world. Um, so I will ask a motion to adopt um, the Fall Creek plan presentation with the condition that we do have to sign. Um, and it sounds like we don't need the landscape condition because there is a plan now. Um, or should I add that as a condition? I would we say seen it. you can go ahead and add it as a condition. We will add the landscape buffer um, as a condition to this as well. If I could get um, a motion um, from one of my board members. Motion to adopt. Jim Miller and Amy are still on. Someone make the motion. I couldn't hear. Did Kirby make it? No one's made it yet. Okay, I'd like to make the motion as stated. Okay, we have a motion. Do I get a second? I'll second. 40 seconds. Thank you. It is approved. Thank you for your presentation. Oh, and your you take roll call. oh sorry, roll call. <laughs> um, Amy Parker. Yes. Kirby McRoblin. Yes. Ben Sisson. Yes. Melissa Farr. Yes. All right. Congratulations, you guys. Um, we're looking forward to your uh, petition or to your application to the Planning Commission so you guys can get the show on the road. So that is approved. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the time. Yeah, can, can, I add, can I have one of those um, pamphlets, like with the green? Yeah, one oh, like that. It's yeah. got everything on it. But there's no, I mean, I, as I say, I mean, let me print one. Okay, off that's so fine. Like, uh, that's fine. And then what's the next planning commission? Oh, um, oh I'm so sorry. Uh, what? Oh, I'm going 
adjourn. Yeah. Meeting, meeting adjourn. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll adjourn it. Yep.